Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one rinse at a time, back with his Monday expert, Mr. Greg Dickerson. How you doing, sir? Doing fantastic, Michael. Good to see you. I uh, see you as well. So I wanted to ask you about something I've heard Grant Cardone, Robert Kiyosaki, and Ken McElroy talk about in the last 10 days. They are now using this term real estate super cycle. I think I understand what they are talking about, but I thought maybe we should talk about it. What, what do we see out there? So when you hear this, and again, I may be surprising you with this um, verbiage, but when you hear a real estate super cycle going on right now, what do you think? What do you think they mean? What, what, what's all that? Well, so what's the context? I mean, what are they? So Robert, Ki Robert Kiyosaki was talking about uh, real estate kind of ownership in single family homes. Because again, back to that Grant and Robert interview, he's very kind of residential focused. Grant Cardone is talking about resident or apartments uh, and really he's talking about cap rates. He actually thinks cap rates will get cut in half, right? Go from four to two or six to three, whatever that is. Uh, and then Ken McElroy is talking about renter nation. Basically, all three of them are using the same verbiage with slightly different ideas. Okay, well, <clears throat> you know, yeah, I would have to see what they're, because they're all three very different. But when you say super cycle, that generally mean, means you know, a parabolic super cycle of an asset. So it can Correct. be any asset. It can be Anything. stocks, gold, cryptos, real estate. You know, we've talked about many times, we're in a super cycle in all assets. We have been for the last 10 years, but, you know, you could probably go back further than that. But definitely the last 10 to 12 years since QE and low interest rates and all yeah. that, um, we've been in a super cycle. The question is, does it end? Where does it end? And it's all interest rate driven. It, you know, everybody knows the market's are a result of the liquidity that's been pumped into them. Everybody knows the real estate boom is obviously the last couple of years because of demand, you know, dimin or supply diminishing and demand increasing due to the pandemic. I don't know that demand has increased, but supply has diminished because yeah, of- Yeah, no question supply has gone down. Yeah, yeah the, the pandemic, the demand's probably the same as it's always been, although it's probably increased because rates are so low. And what's interesting is, you know, you see the feedback we get when we talk about interest rates. Mm. You know, I keep forgetting that a lot of the buyers now and a lot of people entering the market here now in the last 10 years have never seen interest rates higher than where they are now. So to them, <laughs> yeah, 3%, 4%, like, you know, that's, yeah. that, you know, or sub 3%, that's normal. Yeah, we talk about 5%. They think it's like the 80s. I'm like, the 5%? Right. What are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, they've just never seen the rates that we talk about, just like we never saw the rates our parents yeah, talk about, where it was double point. digits. You yeah, know, you're right. Yeah. For us, it was single digits. I saw double digit rates, but it was very briefly. You know, yeah. when I bought my first house back in 1990, 89, 90, it was 10%, 9%. Mm -hmm. um, now, for most of the millennials trying to buy and the younger people that, uh, are coming up. I mean, they've never seen interest rates above probably 4%. Yeah. I don't think, you know, it hasn't been that. So the interesting thing about what Grant's saying in terms of cap rates for commercial and multifamily properties, uh, which is a multiple of the income on a property, there's a lot of ways to define cap rate, but at the end of the day, uh, it's basically um, what your stabilized return on the asset represents if you're paying cash. It's an unlevered return on a stabilized asset. Mm -hmm. He buys primarily stabilized assets. So he's buying true cap rates. He might be able to raise rents a little bit, but he's not doing value add. No, so yeah. he's actually, if you were paying cash on, on a four cap, that means you're going to get a 4% net operating income out of that property right. after all your expenses before any kind of debt service. So to say that cap rates are going to be cut in half is, you know, to me, well, the, it just can't because your rates can't go that low. I think we're at max on yeah. cap rates and you know some funds are paying cash for some properties but at some point with capex reserves and operational costs and things like that you've got to have a certain amount of spread in order for that property to maintain itself I agree so you know I mean we're I mean you're you're buying properties at 3% cap rates in some areas you just can't get any lower than that because it just won't work you can't yeah. find anything Yeah when I when I hear these talk um Basically, what I hear these gentlemen, and again, it's 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 ten minute clips. So who who knows what they really think, right? It could have been spliced together in a way to to mislead me, the viewer. But really, what they're saying is all of these guys expect the Fed to raise rates and then, frankly, give up and lower them again. The only way I see this whole real estate super cycle just continuing to the moon is if rates go lower, right? If we have a thirty year mortgage with a one on it. I just, I don't see it. I think, I think we're in for uh, transactions slowing down. I think the 30-year mortgage will much, it is, 
is going to have a five on it before it has a one on it. But yeah, it's, it's very interesting times. Well, you have to remember, so mortgage rates are based off of treasury yields. They're not, you know, treasury rates. They're not based yeah. off the Fed rate Correct. Uh, in residential. Uh, so, you know, treasuries are going up. Mortgage yeah. rates have gone up and they're yeah. continuing to go up. So refinance demand has been down. You know, housing demand is still kind of there, but it's starting to wane a little bit. But yeah, um, we don't know what the Fed's going to do right now. There's, if the economy in the Fed's eyes looks strong, if we keep adding jobs and inflation keeps rip roaring, which we're going to see another CPI print this week, we're going to see yeah. more job reports this week. Yeah. So if CPI is high again and jobs are up, then the Fed said, the key to what the Fed said that spooked the markets um, last week or two weeks ago, whenever the Fed was, uh, was that we have a lot of room to yeah, raise rates. A lot of room. The strength of the economy. Exactly. Uh, so people initially were saying the Fed may not do anything in March or maybe just a quarter percent rate hike to where now you're starting to see analysts say, well, we might be seeing a half a point because of the way the job market looks and the way inflation looks. And if that happens, that's going to you know put some pressure on rates. The other thing that a lot of people don't realize too, so when you know you talk about cap rates and things like that, there's two things that affect the value of a commercial property. Mm -hmm. Number one, it's all based on the income. Mm -hmm. You know, for the general syndicator like Grant, he has to finance his properties. He's not a cash buyer. No, right. So he has to get a loan. In order for that loan to work, you have to have a certain debt, debt service coverage ratio. He has to raise capital from investors for the down payment. He's got to be able to pay that back. Mm -hmm. Got to be able to service the debt and pay that back. Now, the other thing is, as interest rates rise, that affects credit markets. So liquidity gets you know, less and less available. Credit becomes less and less available. So the credit markets start to tighten a little bit as interest rates go up. So it gets yeah. harder to get the loans and there's different requirements where maybe you have to put more money down. If you have to put more money down, that increases your payback. So the deals don't work at, at a certain level you know, with that. And with the way rents have gone up, you can't necessarily depend on the ability to continually raise no, rents. I agree. At some point you're going to get pushed back and the market's going to shift and you're going to have to drop them a little bit. So yeah. uh, it's 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 interesting. I mean there there is a super cycle across the board and that's what you're probably with McElroy talking about rents. Mm -hmm. You know, rents have reached all time highs, values of properties have reached all time highs, markets have reached all time highs. And without the Fed propping all that up and boosting it, mm -hmm. um, it's not sustainable. No, I agree. And in Something I've gone back to look at the last five or six days is actually Q4 2018. Why did I do that? 2018 was the last time the Fed tried to extract a QE from the system. And it didn't go well. Uh, they At that time, they tried to extract about half a billion dollars, 500 million. There's talk about them having to reduce $2 trillion in excess liquidity in the next 12 months. I got to tell you, that freaks me out because by doing that, I don't know. Rates have to go up, right? They're now going to become a net seller and there's not as many buyers. And yeah, that's what drives up. rates up. Exactly. That's like, oh so my the issues they face there are not just values, you know, and valuations, but again, credit markets. So exactly. you have two big time bombs out there. You have the credit market, meaning all commercial credit, not just real estate loans. We're talking about, you know, bonds, corporate bonds, you know, commercial paper, all those types of things that are tied to interest rates, if rates go up, not only does it damage those instruments, but it also uh, creates problems, you know, in the future of getting more credit, credit tightens because lenders, you know, kind of tighten up a little bit, even though their yields are a little bit higher. But the other thing is the debt bomb, you know, out there, the debt, the debt bubble that we have. Yeah. And, you know, the Fed can only do so much because, you know, in terms of the debt, that's how we monetize our debt. Mm -hmm. is by issuing bonds. And if we're issuing them at higher rates, then, you know, technically we can't afford the debt. And, you know, Stephanie Kelton, the, you know, one of the leading authorities on modern monetary theory, you know, her argument is it doesn't matter. The debt, you know, from the standpoint of servicing and sustaining debt really doesn't matter like people think, because if we're the issuance, we are the issuers of the currency, then we can pay the debt payment, yeah. you know, by just printing more money you know, which is interesting. You yeah, know, in I get the of, logic, but whew, that's yeah. not good. So what damage does that do to the dollar? What damage does that do to investor confidence around the world that wants to buy our bonds? But the same token, uh, you know, it hasn't been a problem so far. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an interesting thought that we could just keep issuing debt and printing the money to service that debt to the investors. 
you know, if you knew I had a little printing press and yeah. my dollar wasn't really going to get devalued, you'd loan me all the money in the world because yeah. you knew I was going to continue to pay you back. Yeah. Um, once the rest of the world loses confidence in the United States and fiscal policy in the United States, and they start to unload their treasuries and they no longer are interested in our debt, that's a problem. And, and then you're looking at, well, the only thing you can do now is literally print money yeah. to pay for things. And then that creates, you know, uh, a fiat emergency and incident where the dollar starts to lose its value. But again, we've been hearing all this as long as I've been, you know, doing business, all I've heard is the dollar is going to zero, mm -hmm. the dollar's crashing and it doesn't happen. It's still the world's reserve currency. That's not going to change anytime soon, mm -hmm. uh, just because we're the largest economy and, you know, we're the only free market economy out there um that can be relied on you know you can't rely on these i mean look what china does or what russia is doing you can't rely on those economies yeah totally agree yeah again i think uh, i think there's a lot of um i i guess what i'll say here is i would not be betting on a real estate super cycle and if super cycle means we go to the moon from here i don't see it i think i think rents got to slow down i think prices have to slow down um well we're already in it but here's here's what i'm saying mm -hmm. it can't go any further without the fed without correct without rates dropping, without QE. Correct. If you stop QE and if you're raising rates, it goes the other way because I it's agree. gone this way because of that. And to deny that and to think it's just going to continue to go up. But, you know, it happens in every cycle, right? That's mm -hmm. where, that's where, you know, things change and people, you know, learn valuable lessons. And we all learned it in 2008 and 9, the same thing. It seemed like it was just going to keep going. There was no end to it. Uh, it was never going to stop. And sure enough, it stopped. And <laughs> there's things out there that we don't even know about. We're not even talking about that are structural issues in the economy around the world yeah. that, you know, there's a reason the Fed's not acting against inflation. Mm -hmm. There's a reason. It's because they can't. Mm -hmm. You know, their their hands are tied. And if they act, it could bring the entire house of cards down. The global economy could deflate around the world where you see a big just house of cards come down and you know everybody's taking a haircut of about 50 percent across the board you know all across the world it's it's a it's a dangerous little game that they're playing and again the debt the credit markets then you know everything else follows behind that i mean that's your big 2008 and 9 financial crisis that's looming out there that they're dancing with and balancing right now oh so fun to think about it's tricky it's tricky. It's tricky. Well, do me a favor. You put out amazing stuff every day. Uh, how do you want people to follow you? Yeah, gregdickerson.com. All my info's there. YouTube channel, podcast. Go check it out. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it.